So, this is going to be fun, um, and thank you, Dave, for the introduction. And just to give you an idea what we've been doing is we have been secret shopping both of your communities. My wife, Jane, where's Jane? Go ahead, stand up way back there. She's sitting back there. She comes with me, and uh, she's the real assessor because, you know, women account for 80% of all consumer spending. I'm waiting. Usually there's a guy in the audience that says, that's all. <laughs> but they also make 70% of the decision where we're going to live, where we're going to go this weekend. And there are guys in the audience say, tell me something I didn't know. But that's a point. So she sees things a lot differently than I do. So we've been doing that. There was no interviews, no heads up. Dave didn't tell us where to stay, what to see, what to do. We got nothing. We came in just like any first time visitor. And there was no input, okay? So nothing of this, none of this was set up or said, make sure you mention this. And by the way, we have not been in either of your communities before last weekend. So this is first time. So there may be things you say, we've, but Roger, we've improved so much. Remember, we're seeing it for the first time. So we only see it as, as from this time. Now, as Dave mentioned, we have assessed more than 1,500 communities around the world uh, in Canada, across in 45 U.S. states, Western Europe, Scandinavia. In Wisconsin, we've been working in Wisconsin for almost 15 years. Um, all the communities in Door County, we went and secret shopped all of those. That was fun. We've been working in Wisconsin Dells. We're the ones who, to, that helped them come up with the water park capital of the world which they should have done and they did do, and it's made a big difference. Um, and then, of course, all of the Fox Cities, 15 of them, we assessed all of that and worked with them. And then just last year, we were working in Shano, who I called Shawano, until finally somebody said, Roger, we're going to hire you anyway, even though you don't know how to pronounce our name. I thought that was so easy, Shawano, how could you ever get that wrong? <laughs> And then Wausau, Wausau, and then Marshfield we did last year. And then, of course, this trip we're doing Racine and then your two communities. And then I have actually got to keynote at the Governor's Conference on Tourism four times. Stephanie Klett, your state tourism director, is a good friend of mine. And we've worked in Green Lake, Manitowish Waters, I mean, Kenosha, Kohler, you name it. Um, and so we got a pretty good idea of, of Wisconsin. Um, I did my internship for the Seahawks, and so there's always been that ever since we got Mike Holmgren out in Seattle, you know, right after they named Mike Holmgren Way in Green Bay. Yeah, that didn't sit well. <clears throat> and, and anyway, so they have good history. Um, and of course, our quarterback now is Russell Wilson. He's got some Wisconsin roots. And so anyway, when we do the assessment, we look at marketing. Was it easy to find information about you? Was it effective? Did it help us close the sale if we wanted to move here? How do you stack up with comp competition? There's a lot of cities and towns in Wisconsin. Was it convenient to get information? But what I'm really going to concentrate on is the on-site assessment, what we did. So Jane and I have been here since last Thursday. So we've been here almost a week in the county. And we looked at signage gateways, wayfinding, overall appeal, critical mass, I'll explain that, amenities, so you have what's parking light, restrooms, you know, things to see and do, on and on and on. And we do this by taking a lot of photographs. And you're going to see what we saw in your two communities. And by the way, no holds barred. Okay? So this is an honest look at you from somebody from the outside. And one thing that's really important, the reason why, I'm really not going to talk about marketing, is because at the end of the day, you're going to be judged by your product. Marketing, no matter how much money you spend, will bring people to Waterford or Burlington once. The only thing that ever brings them back is your product. And that is, what is the primary activity that drew us, right? That made, us, made you worth a special trip. And what else do you have to offer while we're here? And then your amenities, which are like parking, public restrooms, visitor information, parks, all those things, and then the people we interact with. That's it. So when we do this assessment, we wear three hats. 
So this is not just about tourism. Even though the real Racine contracted with us and played the lion's share of this, this is not just about tourism. The way we see this is, are you a great place to live, raise a family, or maybe retire? Would we live here to work, invest in, or bring a business to one of your two towns? Or as a leisure visitor? But one that might sp sp spend the night. So here's the question that we did this whole assessment. Based on the news of Foxconn coming, which will create over time about 10,000 direct jobs, which will spin nearly another 10,000 indirect jobs. That's a lot of new jobs. So if they're going to bring all these people in, they're going to come from around the world. A lot of them, they want to get as many local. If I want to get a job at Case, at SC Johnson, or Foxconn, where would I live? That is how we did this. So we came in not really knowing this whole county at all. And, and then we wanted to say, with them coming in, where would I want to invest? Would it be Lake Pleasant? Would it be out here? Would it be in Racine? Where would it be? Where, would you, where are the best opportunities? And so we did this as the focus. So the focus is in tourism. And so one thing that's really important about this, this has changed all across the country, is in the past, all jobs, people, companies went, people went where the jobs were. For the first time in U.S. history, jobs are going where the people want to be or where the talent is. So with Foxconn and big development like that, I think even President Trump is coming out to do the groundbreaking. They've already broken ground. But here's the point, is if you're a company like Foxconn or any of these big companies, they can easily get people to come down from Milwaukee, they can come up from Chicago, what you don't want is people coming up here, earning the money, getting back on trains, buses, or cars, creating traffic nightmares, and then heading out with the money that they made in this county. The whole goal is how do you make this a desirable place that people want to live rather than commute to and from? Does that make sense? So that's the whole, the whole focus of what we wanted to do. And so the big deal is, is we are now in the age of placemaking. If you are a place, particularly for young families, so if you're one of those places where the kids graduate from high school and the second they graduate, they said, the second I'm out of here, I'm blowing this down. And that's what you want to stop. What do you do to get them to come back? And so here is why, you might say, well, then why is Racine County, why is Dave and his staff, why are they footing most of the bill on this? Well, because here's the thing. Tourism is the front door to your non-tourism economic development. Remember I said quality of life is leading economic development. Nothing showcases it like tourism. And it's the purest form of economic development. People come, they spend money, and go home. We like that, right? And then it's the fastest growing industry in Wisconsin. And if you want to get visitors, the first thing you do is how do you get them to stop? Then, if you can get people to stay two hours in Burlington or Waterford, spending will double, just two hours. And then, if you can get them to spend overnight, four times. You know what I always say? I'd rather see you get half the visitors spending twice as much money and time. And so that's really important. And then, here's what you need to understand. We might come here for, I don't know whether it's the Fox River, whether whatever the big thing is, but the number one activity once we arrive, not the reason we came, but the number one activity once we arrive is shopping, dining, entertainment in a pedestrian-friendly, intimate setting, your downtowns. And by the way, that is where 80% of all non-lodging visitor spending takes place. So if you can get, them, us, get us here in Burlington, we spend the night over in the Hampton Inn, and we might eat a dinner here, but you know, if we can spend the night, do you have this? Now, here's the big one, you ready? That 80%, that's why they put downtown Disney outside each of its parks. But here's the big deal. <coughs> of that, 70% happens after six. Yeah. That was kind of a problem. 
70%, you have to understand, we're at work the rest of the time. That's the National Retail Federation came up with that. You know who's part of that? Walmart, Piggly Wiggly, Walgreens, CVS, all the big box retailers that are open until like 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, midnight, 24 hours, and yet your downtowns, if you close at 6, you're not going to get your young people to come back either. And so there's the question, are you open? And then, you know, there it is, you must promote your local businesses. I've seen so many communities say, well, we can't promote local business. We're using public money to promote local business. Well, yeah, that's called economic development. Can you imagine Orlando? We have 172 attractions, but we can't mention any of them by name because they're all privately owned. You know, we got that one, you know, the mouse with the big ears. You know, I mean, can you imagine Napa Valley? Oh, we have 242 wineries, but we can't mention by name because they're all privately owned. You need to promote your private businesses. So now, with that as a setup, we did a little bit of research. We did get the real scene. We looked at their website as a visitor. Um, we downloaded the guide. We actually had them send us one. We used that. But once we got here, we found another guide for Burlington. So we used these. Now, anybody looking for a place to live, invest in, or to visit, I, you need to understand what they do. A lot of times what people do is they will go to Google and they will just type in Burlington, Wisconsin, and look at the pictures and, and determine whether you're a place. Yeah, I know some of you are seeing, seeing that right there. I don't even know what that is. But one thing I did see is some streets underwater. That's how I knew you had to flood. But a lot of times here's Chocolate City. But, you know, people do this just to get, just to get a quick, you know, overlook. What's it like? And so I didn't see anything really negative. There was a good map right there, but this is, this is what we do. You know, then I see things like this, and it looks like a nice downtown. I wish there, would be, I wish there were human beings in the picture. <laughs> but, I mean, they just pull these from the web. So, by the way, as you populate, as you populate your websites and everything, always make sure you load them with photographs, because Google just picks up photos from everywhere, that are tagged that might have the word Burlington in Wisconsin or WI in there. But by the way, see that little number there? Throughout this presentation, these are suggestions. There are lots of suggestions for you. None of them are recommendations because we never talked to you first. It would, be, it would be really presumptuous for me to come in as an outsider and tell you what you need to do in Burlington and Waterford. So all I'm doing here is offering you suggestions. Many of these you may already be working on. And if so, great, you've been validated. And so that was one of them. You know, if you can, I would always, on Instagram, Instagram is huge. By the way, if you want to talk to millennials, they go to Instagram, their parents use Facebook. And a lot of these photographs, as long as they're tagged with like a hashtag Burlington, Wisconsin, or Waterford, or whatever, as long as you use some of those, Google will start to pick those up and they'll start showcasing great photos of you. But that's what people do. We tend to do that. Here's Waterford. So we just typed in Waterford and we could see all the pictures and it looks like there was a, a fire at some point right there. But sometimes it'll even pick up ones you go, now where the heck is that? Um, and so you, it's not always perfect, but it just gives you a glimpse. But I will tell you that when you look at it and you see uh, this photo came, I went, oh my gosh. So this is at Realtor.com, and so we just thought, wow, what a setting. I'm not sure right where that was, but it looked really nice. So those are the kinds of things that people do, just trying to explain what you're like. So we did go to Burlington. We did find, I think this is the city's website. Um, looked great. No real comments there. Um, we did find the Chambers site um, right there, and it's got the attractions and everything. It was more of just more lists. But it was, it was good. And so we do, all these people look at all of these kinds of things, you know, and we're looking at pictures, we're looking at, and this one does a good job. It says business development, visitors, our village, government. Well done. So nothing negative at all. So we do this. We have several people secret shopping you online. You know, thank you for accepting this invitation experience, a virtual tour of our community. I thought that was well done. Um, boy, I wanted to come back for July, for water for the balloon fest. Is that cool or what? Looks like it'd be really amazing. 
The other thing that we do, so people, here's what they do. Number one, we look for the community. What's it going to be like? What can we expect? And then the next thing we'll do is look for schools. If you want young families, the very, one of the first things they're going to do is what are the schools like? So, of course, I typed in top-rated school districts in Wisconsin. We didn't say Milwaukee area or Madison or Kenosha or Racine County. We're just looking for the whole state. And people will go to whatever sites they can, like here we go, this is Wisconsin School District ratings for Racine, uh, or no, for the state. You can see down there, it'll tell you what county they're in. And so you might scroll down that. And these are just the resources that people are using. So here we are, this is best public schools in Racine. Um, you can see where they're, where they're located, um, the ones where they're challenged, and you know, one thing that's really important on your websites is to showcase your schools. Particularly here, because your schools on this side of 94 generally outperform those on the east side of 94. That's a selling point for you. And so I think it's important to show that where, where they are. And you can see there's Kenosha School District, you know. Um, and by the way, sometimes we will check out the competition. So if we're going to go work at Fox County, we say, well, geez, we could get to from Kenosha. So they're comparing Racine County to Kenosha. See what I mean? So you have to understand people are going to do that. By the way, I think this was really cool. We were in Waterford, taught the grade school there. And we did see this. And it said Evergreen Elementary School significantly exceeded expectations. Now. We thought, that is so cool, they put it right on the school. However, then it said exceptional staff, exceptional community, exceptional families, exceptional students. And I started thinking, well, wait a second, maybe this is a self-platitude. See what I mean when you start saying exceptional families and everything? But if that significant exceeded expectations came from a third party, I would put it in there in quotes and where it came from. Because that carries a lot of weight. But when we saw those other things, it was kind of like, well, I think they're just saying that. And, and by the way, there's nothing wrong with it because it builds community pride. Now, just so you know, motivating factors for young families. Number one is job and business opportunities. And you have thousands of unfulfilled jobs in this county. Most of them are family wage. Number two, schools. And this is in priority. This is in order of importance. Number three is housing, quality neighborhoods, affordability, amenities, you know, like your parks. Then number four is recreation, shopping, and downtowns. And number five is diversity. One thing you need to understand is the millennial generation is the most diverse generation in American history. And they embrace it. And so you're going to see a lot of people looking for it. But that is in order of their importance. So they will do things like just shop you. They will go to realtor.com. There's 1.8 million. And I'm scrolling down because we're not in the millennial price range yet unless their parents are going to give it to them. <laughs> and so we start going down there. This is just what people do. I'm just letting you know how people do this. And of course, I'm going through these pretty fast. You know, and I figured, okay, for this area, um, this is Waterford, by the way. You know, so I'm looking down here, and by the way, you're seeing quality houses, you're seeing rough price ranges, you're seeing amenities in here, and now we're down in the, you know, the 300s here, and this is how people get a feel for an area. So does that make sense? So this is all the online stuff they do. And then, of course, you know, we look at maps like this. And, and just try to see, and one thing that we came away from is that part that just turned yellow over there, we thought, okay, that's Urbania, that's urban. That's that side of 94, and what our first impression was, that's where all the urban everything is. But one thing that was really cool is we said, well, if you live near Waterford, it's a pretty easy shot to, to Milwaukee. It's a pretty easy shot to Racine. It's a pretty easy shot to 94. It's a pretty easy shot even down to Kenosha. Um, you know, by the way, these are not all, and look, you're pretty close to Lake Geneva, so you got skiing and everything here. And then, boy, you're over not that far from 43. And you know, one thing that I really liked was once you get over 94, that decompression is you head this way. You could feel it. And so each time we came out here from Racine, we just, it was like a breath of fresh air. 
And I really thought, really, your focus should be country living. You're close, you're on this side where you have these beautiful homes, neighborhoods, you have farms, it feels safer. Somebody, somebody came up to me and said, you know, I find it, we, uh, they said, we, I haven't used a key to my house in years, I had to go get one made. You know, I mean, that doesn't happen everywhere anymore. And so anyway, we thought, you know, that really kind of set the tone for us. So with that as a background, we decided, here we come. You ready? Now, we did end up staying in Racine, and the only reason we stay in Racine is, is because that's a bigger part of the assessment, just because it's a bigger city, and we want to stay in one place. That's the only reason. Otherwise, we would have been right here, and we probably would have stayed at the Hampton Inn. I mean, it's right on the river, and I'm a Hilton Honors, and, and on and on. So we came out, but we did come out, and, um, you know, the one thing that I had right off the bat was don't market accolades after three years. So when you say we are the, uh, we are the Little League State champions as up to 2012, what happens is, boy, over the last six years, they haven't done very well, have they? <laughs> See what I mean? And so I just say after about three years, you can't write it because that's what people will think. They used to be good. And so, so that's, and so you just have to understand from the minds of consumers, you know, I think you should be very proud of that fact, but that's what they're going to think. And so we did see that, Tony Romo and everything, I thought that was cool. And we see Chocolate City, we can't wait to find it. Because you're Chocolate City. And so, you know, even things, there it is, there's that. So, uh, you know, a couple things. You have four seconds to read signs. There's no way. When people are going down a road, four seconds. There's no way we can read Chocolate City, Welcome to Burlington, Home of, and then the Little League, and then Chocolate Fest, and then Tony Romo. And by the way, Tony Romo is almost getting covered with weeds. <laughs> I think I'll send him a note. He's in the broadcast booth now, isn't he? Yeah, anyway. He would love it. Um, so we, really, here's one thing is, I don't know why it is, and by the way, I'm gonna intermix Burlington and Waterford here, but when you come into Burlington every single way, what happens is the first thing you do is assault us with a sign about all your parking rules and regulations. Now, are we supposed to stop, pull over, get out of the car, and read all of that? Really, is that how you wanna welcome us to your town? That's 40 words. We have four seconds. And so, so I thought, really, is that really necessary? You know, and by the way, if that one doesn't get you, we have that one, but then we have to add some more. And if that's not enough, we've got that, there's your welcome sign, and then we hit you with some more rules and regulations, and this is in red, which really means danger, stay away. I mean, it's, this is just, you know what? The first two signs have 50, 55 words. Then your welcome sign has 28 words. And then the next back sign back there is 24 words. We'd have to stop, get out of our car for two or three minutes, yet you didn't provide us any public parking to do it. <laughs> and so, you know, as a matter of fact, you hit us with all the rules before you even say welcome. I just don't think it's necessary. So now, so we finally, after all these signs, we finally went back and wrote them all down so we could get them straight because we didn't want to get a ticket. <laughs> so one is 2 to 5 a.m. alternate parking restrictions. I have no clue what that means. I don't know if that's alternate, like even side of the street addresses and odd side of the streets. I mean, I have no clue what that means. And then 10 p.m. to 6 a.m., no parking if we got three inches of snow. So I'm sure people rush outside to measure it. And then, and then snow emergency parking applies to all city streets. And then we have no longer than 24 hours can you park on the street. And by the way, vehicles are subject to tow, and if you have any questions, call the cops. I just don't know that this is really necessary. This is the only town I've seen this in, and we've worked all over. 
Pennsylvania, Michigan, Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, Iowa, Minnesota. I mean, I've never seen that. I think it's a little over the top. I think you'd be better off in October, before the first snowfall, sending out a mailer, everybody, to remind them of the parking restrictions. Okay? So, that being said, when you go to Waterford, look. This is me pitting one against the other, see? It says, welcome, designated Main Street community. They didn't hit us with all their rules and regulations first. However, I would probably put the Main Street community closer to their downtown because I'm out here in a residential area. Um, you know, they also have a good job there. It says historic downtown that way. Their sign's a little easier to read, and this is a hint. You know what's going to be coming. Look, historic downtown, those letters you can actually read from a car. The signs in Burlington you can't even read if you're on foot. <laughs> the letters are like, you know. So anyway... You know, and this always cracks me when I say, stop for pedestrians and crosswalks. It's like, rats! <laughs> I really wanted to mow them down. <laughs> you know, I would, and by the way, I don't even know where there are any crosswalks close to this sign. So sometimes I think, you know, you might, what you might do is put that right next to the sidewalk that says, caution, pedestrian crosswalks, you know. Um, and, but I think overall people get it. There might have been an accident. And then for Burlington, you got to start over with your wayfinding. I mean, you can't read it. Number one, you don't use serifed fonts, which are the little, I mean, they're, they're way too small. They're, they're, they're about the right size for pedestrian wayfinding. So if you want to do something, you could move those signs down a few feet and let them be for pedestrians. You know, and then put bigger vehicular ones up above if you wanted. So... This was a problem all over the county, by the way, because Racine has zero wayfinding. And I have to tell you, when we assess Racine, if you want to see what we said about Racine, Friday morning, <laughs> 7.30. Yeah, it's early. Racine was probably the, out of the 1,500 assessments we've ever done in 35 years of doing this, was probably the toughest to find anything in. A lot of times we ended up in neighborhoods, we thought there were six downtowns, most of them were vacant, so you can imagine. But at least you have wayfinding out here, even though it's hard to read. And so this countywide needs to be a big deal. And that includes amenity signage, which is like visitor information, uh, restrooms, uh, uh, public parking, medical, police, fire, all of those. Those are amenities. It needs to include where your attractions and activities, boat launches, public access points, I mean, trail markers and access points. We saw trails all over this county. We have no clue what any of them are called and where they connect to or anything because there's no trail maps or markers. And then we find out tonight that there's actually two Fox Rivers. I said, so does this one connect over in Appleton? Because we worked in all the Fox. Oh, no, that's a different Fox River. You know, so those are the things that are kind of confusing. Visitor information kiosk, pedestrian wayfinding, all of these things, pole banners, um, all of these things are part of wayfinding. And by the way, this is the kind of wayfinding you need. It's like one inch tall letters for every 30 feet of viewing distance. So the signs in downtown Burlington, the letters need to be about four times larger. You actually make one of those signs and you hold it, it looks enormous, but when you're in a car, you go, now I get it. And so, by the way, never more than five items on any sign. This one has four. You know, but there's a place called the Woodlands in Texas, and, and the signs look like a place called Woodlands. And so, this is in Appleton. Just so you understand, that sign there was about $800. It's got an aqueous coating, so ice doesn't stick on it. Graffiti won't stick on it. It's got stainless steel hardware, and it's mounted on an existing power pole. They put up 18 of those signs, and the retail sales went up by more than 10%. And that's fairly simple to do. And they even have these downtown showing their downtown for pedestrians. And so when you do wayfinding, it plays a role in your branding efforts, whether it's chocolate or whatever your brand is. We're going to talk about that. And then it's a major component in your marketing. It reinforces a positive experience. It increases spending locally. 
And then it educates visitors and locals about what you got and where it's located. Because remember, we hadn't been here before. We were here for a couple hours before we finally got, the, before we found a Burlington visitor guide. Because we're just scouting it out. And it builds community pride and it's as much a science as an art. And that might have been your challenge. I don't know who designed the signs, but there are, there are only a handful of companies across the country that do wayfinding. I mean, it gives me a headache when I see what they go through for viewing distances, the type of lettering, even the spaces between the lettering, kerning. Even that's all part of wayfinding. And so it does increase retail services between 14 and 28%. So it's an, it is a, um, it's an investment, not an expense. And by the way, navigation systems are not a substitute for wayfinding. You know what we use for navigation systems? Uh, uh, I can go, hey Siri, uh oh, everybody's phones are gonna go off now. Hey Siri, take me to the Hampton Inn Burlington, right? Because we know it exists. But I don't know that you have a spinning top museum. I don't know that you have a log. I don't, we put, type in navigation systems, things we already know exist. Your wayfinding tells us about stuff we didn't know you had. So that is no substitute. And that's what's really important. And we even have, uh, Dave is gonna have access to these that he'll get to you so that if you want to say, hey, we need to redo our wayfinding system in Waterford didn't really, it had a few, but Burlington needs, if you need to do it, there's a, we have a video in our library that tells you how to do it, step by step. Okay? Sound good? And so, now, with your pole banners, you know what? I always tell cities, don't put historic buildings on your pole banners. We're already downtown, we can see the buildings. Instead, sell the feeling. Because, you know, I know you're a historic downtown, but yeah, what is there to do? If you go to Appleton, that's what their banners look like in the middle of downtown. I mean, you know, um, or this is over in Allegheny, which is in western New York State. I mean, it's a Victorian, a cute little town, and the pole banners sell a feeling. So when you get a chance to do your pole banners, just don't show buildings, sell a feeling. That's what you're trying to do, okay? So just another suggestion there. So now, we're exploring your two towns. We kind of got through the wayfinding, and by the way, every time we have left Racine, we've had to get wayfinding even to get out here. Today, it took us like almost to Waterford and then said go south. I'm not too sure why. But once we're here, we're exploring. You know, one thing is when I see signs that day, we have Gateway Technical College or whatever was with it already went out of business. Signs like that, if you have wayfinding, you really don't need it. I would just take it down. It doesn't do any good, really. When we first came into the area, we did see McKenna Park. Um, very nice amenity. And, um, and then while we were there, we made a turn. We went up, I turned up the street, um, and because I think that's where we saw the Gateway College sign. We saw the Wellness Center there. Looks very nice. We thought, boy, this place has some cool amenities. We pulled into the wellness center. We could see the backside of the lake. And I don't know, what are those birds? But those are huge cranes. I'm usually, but they're really cool. They're standing, I mean, I got pretty close to them. But I thought, how cool is that? See what I mean? You don't find that in downtown Racine. And so, anyway, and then we saw the YMCA across the lake, and that looked really cool. And so we're starting to get a good feeling. We saw the Gateway Technical College, which we've seen all over the county. Um, we saw the high school look good. So remember, if we're looking for a place to live, raise a family and everything, so far, it's all thumbs up, okay? I mean, it looks great. I, it just looks like you care. Uh, Bushnell Park looked great. I love the trail system. However, I don't know how long it is. I don't know where it goes. I don't know if you allow cross-country skiing in the winter on it or snowmobiles. I don't know. There's Because we couldn't find any trails anywhere that had any kind of signage. And so I think that would be good to know. Over in Shano, this one's getting a little tired, but all over in Shano, they did this. You can see Shano Pathways, and they actually have a place where you can, the map is showing you where the trails are, and they also show you the length 
whether they're bikes, whether it's just on foot, whether it's horseback, the kind of trails, whether it's paved, whether it's gravel, and you can actually grab a trail map. So doing something like that would be really great. One thing I was really impressed with is that you have lighted fields. That's pretty rare. And in a rural area, I thought that's pretty cool. And so, so that's out at Bushnell. And we thought, really great. Across the street is this. Um, once again, I don't know if this is part of that same trail, if it's a different trail, because there's no information. Now, there is a sign there, but it's really about Chocolate City. And it really lists your events. And, and my one question we had right off the, right off the bat is, your Chocolate City Memorial Day weekend, what are you the other 362 days of the year? Because we couldn't find it. And so that was kind of a challenge. Now you do list your events there. You know, one thing that I thought, if you want to be the Chocolate City, because you know what, we've worked in Hershey, Pennsylvania. And that's Chocolate Town. Wasn't there, there was probably, I think there was some kind of a, lawsuit or something about that. We're Chocolate City, they're Chocolate Town. You know, and there, even the street lights are like Hershey Kisses. They have Hershey Park, which is like a theme park. Um, you know what? Hershey's doesn't even make chocolate in Hershey, Pennsylvania anymore. But they still own the brand. If, I know you're Nestle, that's the competition, but if you, you still could be chocolate, but I thought, well, if you had a confectioner with a chocolate specialty, I didn't see one. I thought, well, what if you did, you know, more chocolate-related events, maybe like 10 a year? I know you spend all year doing chocolate fest. And you go, oh my gosh, we're so burned out. You want us to do more? But maybe all it is is a fondue party, chocolate fondue party in the park. I mean, if you had a fudge shop in town, or if you had, did you know signs about chocolate, where the beans come from, well, how Nestle produces them, anything, and I thought if you did restaurants that serve specialty chocolate dishes or desserts, like chocolate creme brulee, is there such a thing? It probably is. You know, I mean, just if you, you could still own it. If you had retailers selling chocolate recipe books, I mean, famous Burlington brownies, you know, um, you know, that would work really well in Canada. Here, they just legalized marijuana. <laughs> I don't know if Wisconsin, they could be Alice's brownies. Anyway. But even if you just had, if you had somebody that made brownies, good brownies, healthy brownies, um, something like that, and then great chocolate, ice cream, sundaes, maybe locally made, if you did chocolate fondue events every Saturday, hot chocolate variations at winter events, I love hot, I love peppermint hot chocolate. I mean, you could do some cool things. Because all we saw was, we saw this, Chocolate Fest, I mean, we, we did drive in there and we're just going, is anything else ever happen in this space? I, I, just, I just think that you could take chocolate and still make it your brand and how, Nestle may not be there to help you, you have to just do it on your own. Or what you do is say, what's next? I mean, I gotta tell you, that nobody that I know is going to move their family to Racine because they're the Kringle capital. <laughs> and I love Kringles, we had to go buy one, but it's not the reason we're gonna live there. See what I mean? Now chocolate has a lot more appeal than even Kringles. So you could do it, but it's gonna take some work and you're gonna need to get your retailers and your businesses you know, maybe when you check in Hampton, you know, all Hilton properties, they give you cookies, but maybe they're, uh, you know, they're, and they do chocolate chip, and maybe these are extra special because you're Chocolate City. You could still do the brand, but you're going to have to do more than you're doing now. One weekend a year is not enough. So, you know, and then, you know, even this, I thought, you know, rather than list your events, what if you put the top five things to do while in Burlington? on that sign. Because the events, if we don't time it just right, it's like, well, so much for that. You know, but if we said, wow, did you know we have this trailer, we have this, or we have uh, a great shop downtown or something, that'd be great. And then by the way, um, do you have, so in Burlington, 
Our first thing is, is there a place we could rent boats? Can you do, do people do river rafting in Burlington? They do. They don't? They don't. They do some kayaking. But you have to go to Waterford in order to rent a kayak, right? See what I mean? So we're here. We can't rent bikes. We can't go on your trails. We, I mean, we can walk places. But there's really, you're not monetizing your tourism. Or people that may say, which we ride these trails, we say, wow, we should live here. And by the way, you know, this is, do you call this the river walk? Okay, you do. Because there's no signs on it. We just assumed that's probably what it was called. We did see it somewhere. It's fantastic. It's just stunning. And, you know, then you had some really great sports fields. This is Beaumont Field. Um, and we just saw all these sports fields. We thought maybe that could be a focus. Who knows? We also saw Echo Park, um, which is, where is it? Right, right here, right? Right outside the doors here. And once again, we thought, man, why don't you have vendors out here, you know, renting things? I don't know why you don't monetize things. That could be a small business opportunity for somebody. And maybe do cross-country skis in the winter. So anyway, and I don't know if anything really happens, you know, at this part. Now, we saw lots of people fishing. They're not out there today, but they were right over there. Right now, they'd be totally underwater, I think. But here's my question. Do you need a fishing license to fish? Where would you get it? Online? Hardware store? Walmart? Okay, uh, okay. And, and what do we catch out there? All kinds of things. Crawdads. No, what, what, I mean, what do you do? Is it trout, steelhead? What do you catch out there? Carp? It must not be that good. Okay. Oh, there, and now we're getting a lot of, okay, you're right. Okay. Well, I, there are people out there, there were like three or four people out there fishing. But I just thought, if you, if you do, if fishing is a good thing, I would probably put a sign there. What we do is we put rules and regulations and say, you know, here's what you'll catch. Here's where you can get a fishing license. You'll go to the hardware store, monetize it. Why not? And so we did see uh, the, the dam right out there. And look at, this is it the other day. Now look at it. You can't even see the rocks. And so the other thing is, when we first came in, there was a bunch of people out there. They crawl under the fence. Why can't people go out on that? It's got a fence all the way around it. I mean, you could put this danger, please stay within the fence. But I just thought, gee whiz, it's such a way. I wanted to get up there and take a picture of the lake. It was gorgeous and everything. And, and it just says, danger, keep off. You know, I thought, really? Come on, you guys. You know, and I don't know. Maybe sometimes somebody did fall off and they died. I don't know. You could explain undertoes. But anyway, we just didn't understand why. Then you've got a couple of these. Um, I, that, I think that's probably the backside of utility boxes. I think I see power lines right here. Is that right? And I thought, why don't you use that and say, welcome to Echo Park. You know, and say, while you're here, here's top three things to do in Burlington. I mean, rather than just have an ugly piece of plywood, turn it into something that can, th this is low-hanging fruit stuff. You know, this lower section here, you've got the parking regulations, which is fine. That's nicely done. By the way, I usually don't like municipal parking. One thing you're getting to understand with Foxconn, a lot of these companies, they're foreign. They know what public parking is. Municipal parking, they're going to think, is for city employees only. So public parking, don't call it municipal parking. I think the signs are decorative. The rules are easy to understand. Um, but this lower structure down here is really kind of like, what is this about? Oh, there's a little teeny post something there. I don't know what that, I don't even know what that's about. But anyway, just, you know, take it down or use it. You know, we also saw out here at Wemoff Jucker, is, is that, did I pronounce it right? Wemoff Yucker? Okay, see, well, this is why you ask, you know. See, now Shano, you know, I had to learn this one here. But it's a beautiful park. I mean, by the way, a lot of Canadian geese are having their goslings right now. But, but uh, I'm sure they're the bane of the city. They usually are. Um, I mean, they poop more than dogs, you know. <laughs> and there's nobody to clean up after them. But the thing is, we just thought, what a stunningly beautiful place to live. Okay?
So, so far, I made a couple wisecracks, but overall, incredible. Now, one thing when we drive out this area, we do see these rustic roads. They're not numbered, they're not lettered, they're just rustic roads. And we don't know what that means, so we went, you know, I was going to call your state tourism director and say, okay, explain rustic roads. But the thing is, there is some information, I think David and the guide, you talk about rustic roads, what they're, what, that you'll see scenery and everything, but I don't know which ones I'll see what. And, and they say, oh, and a lot of them say, you're going to see a lot of beautiful scenic farmlands. You know what? You're in Wisconsin. Every road sees beautiful scenic farmlands. <laughs> and so, so we, we went down a couple of them for a couple miles and went, we didn't see anything better than, than your main roads out here with those. But if you promote them, you know, I would just, you know, say, well, if this was Rustic Road number three, then we could look that one up and see what's on it that would be any different. But we weren't too sure. Um, and so, you know, we don't know how long a drive it is, what we'll see, uh, is there an app for it, where do we get info, is there a map brochure somewhere. Um, we did come to Richard Bong State Recreation Air, that would go good with the uh, Alice's Brownies. Just, just kidding. It just slipped out somehow, you know. So anyway, and I hope that's not the top activity there. But when I talk about the top activity is, is it hiking, is it bird watching, is it wildlife viewing? Rather than have recreation areas, you can promote recreation areas, but what I want you to do is promote what the activity is. These are great hikes or cross-country trails in the winter. Always promote the activity. When you say Wisconsin's largest managed prairie, I have no idea what that means. As far as I'm concerned, the managed prairie must mean private sector is allowed to farm it. I, I don't know. What does it mean? Does anybody know? What is a managed prairie? Ask the state. Thank you. <laughs> but you're right. I mean, you wouldn't know. So what's the activity? Okay? And then like this, and by the way, it says state recreation area office two miles. Now, we weren't sure whether that's where you're supposed to start or whether we could turn down that road. It's a little bit confusing. So these are all little things that, that visitors notice. While we're out there, you know, one thing is the county's using all these big brown signs. We always have to put a shape of the county on it as if anybody cares besides the county. <laughs> it doesn't mean anything. And a lot of these look a little bit dated. This is a beautiful golf course. So if you get a chance down the road, you might start doing these more decorative signs. I think it would be great. Um, I don't think they do justice for this golf course, which by the way, looks like a beautiful golf course. But one thing is about a golf course like this. Is this nine holes or 18? 18. 18. Is it open to the public? Okay, is there a pro shop there? Yes. Sort of. Yes, no, and sort of. Okay, well, that clears that up. Is there a restaurant? Sort of, okay. It's more like a snack bar, right? Okay. Do they offer golf instruction? Do they have cart and club rentals? I know you have carts, but not clubs, right? You don't even know. But here's the point, and by the way, do they offer like cross-country skiing on the course during the winter? No. no. Okay. You can. You can, but you shouldn't. You might get arrested, but other than that, go for it. But here's the point. At the golf course, they should put up a sign that just says, we're open for public play, um, uh, maybe a URL for tee times. Uh, club and cart rental, snack bar, all you need is a sign. Because right now we just go, we don't know, and you know what visitors do? They say one word, next, and they're gone. Now, you locals may be saying, that's exactly what visitors to do at our golf course. And I would get that. And then, by the way, we did, we finally found where that happens. We read all about this. And by the way, they also have this water ski show in Shano, and of course, you're never going to knock the Wisconsin uh, Tommy Bartlett show off the map, but that's going to be popular in Wisconsin. 
And so we did finally find where the aqueducts are. See, there's no wayfinding. So even if we were to come here to find them, we wouldn't know. So we did finally see that. We missed it. We got here Thursday night, so we came out Friday. Um, looks like great beaches. And while we were there, we saw, oh, look, a marina over there. We can go, maybe they rent boats. Yeah, I'm getting there. <laughs> and so, and I even thought, here you are at this beautiful park, and here's a mom uh, uh, stand-up paddling boarding with her daughter. And I thought, man, there's a small business opportunity for somebody. This would be a perfect lake for, Jay and I were thinking, man, we'd like to go rent a couple of stand-up paddle boards to try our hand at it, right? Can't rent them. You don't monetize things. And you know, if we rent those, we have a good time. We might say, we should just live here. See what I mean? And so I think those are great opportunities. You know, now we did see Petrie's, uh, Petrie's, is that right? Yeah. Petrie's, whatever, Marina, we thought, there it is. Here we go. So we drove in there and <laughs> we heard a little banjo music, but it wasn't too loud. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm really being honorary tonight, I don't know why. But we did get to see the entire family tree over there. It tells when they all lived and died, which ones are still living and everything. And so we couldn't really find the marina office. There's a really cool log cabin right there to the left. And then you go down here, it says absolutely no swimming, and it's like absolutely no walking either. And so we kind of figured this is not where you rent boats. We could not find any place in Burlington. Can, is there any place in Burlington you can rent a boat? No. There's a missed opportunity. And so, so that turned out to be, I think, just a private marina that people probably rent slips in. Um, we did go out to the terminal, the airport. And by the way, do they have, they do have hangars there, I think, right? Okay. Is there a restaurant there? No. Okay. Do they do charter flights out of here? No. Okay, is there any uh, fuel and tie downs? Okay, is there any flight instructors? Once again, put a sign. You're, you're turning away a lot of business that would give people reasons to come back, stay longer, spend money, or move here. And I think if those businesses exist, you need to promote them. Now, here we come, Waterford. <laughs> Are you sweating it after the bad time I just gave Burlington? So we drove into Waterford and we saw this little park and immediately we went, yay, somebody in Racine County actually rents kayaks and canoes because we couldn't even find any little thing like this in Racine. There is one? Well, 6th Street and somewhere. Well, you know what? We never found it. I'll remind them of that Friday morning. But this is so great. So we did walk in there, we did talk to the lady, and I think her son or a young guy there, and we, if we would have had time, we would have done it. Now, here was our challenge. When I said, you know, if we wanted to rent kayaks, would you suggest we go in the river, the lake? Um, because, we, I mean, looking at the lake right here, which is, I think, just, do you call this a lake? It's just an extension of the river, whatever it is. But there's people already up there kayaking. Now, the young man said, if it was me, I would go down the river. Because when you're up here, you're also competing with all the motorized boats and everything. Which is a really good point. So then we said, well, that's a really good point. But is there a way we could... And by the way, when you look at this, it looks like if you go above the dam, which is, I think, we're like right, right in here, right? Um, and then it looks like this lake is really expansive and everything. They thought, wow, look at all these little places you could do. Now, of course, when we went to the photograph of it, it looked totally different. Although today it might look like that drawing up, up here, right? So anyway, we thought, well, we would love to rent the kayaks and go down the river to like uh, Rochester, right? Would that be there's a dam at Rochester? But even if you could go all the way to Burlington, if there was a way somebody would bring us back. Because if we're going to spend two or three hours going down the river, and it wasn't running as fast as it is now, but it was running pretty fast even last weekend, we don't want to go down there and then paddle all the way back up. And I think we would have been willing to pay more 
Because of that, we didn't do it. Because we didn't want to be out there with power boats, and we thought the river would be fantastic, but we did not want to come all the way back upstream. So I think there's an opportunity for them down the road to maybe offer that hay for an extra such and such every day at five o'clock or whatever time, you know, we, we'll meet you there and we'll, we'll pick up the kayaks or whatever. Make sense? But we love this park and everything. And here's Jane sitting in a regular sized chair. I always knew she was short. <laughs> but that's fun. You know what? You know what I would do? You know what I would add to things like this? Is I would add a hashtag. For Instagram, a little hashtag, you know, that says Waterford. A hashtag Waterford WI or Waterford, Waterford Waterfront or Waterford, whatever. Come up with a cool little name. Because when people post pictures like this, they don't know where to post them on Instagram that would give you credit. But because those are great. So while we're there, we did, we did find um, the nature camp. Um, it looked fine. Now, one thing I would do in the nature camp, it's got kind of the trails and everything here. But I'm not too sure what we would see. And the whole left side of this is empty. I mean, this would be a great place to put some information about while you're in Waterford, you ought to check out this and this and this. Just a poster. You know, I mean, I just thought that was really great. But there was no brochures. And by the way, we've got the, how do you pronounce it? Is it Wadowitz? Wadowitz? Wadowitz Nature Trails. We've got the scriggly lines right here. But I don't know how long these are. I don't know where they go. The trail map's empty. The holder... We could see where they mowed it, you know, somebody mowed it, but no information. These are all little things you could fix for a few dollars. And so once again, I thought, man, if there was just a little trail map or show us, because I have no idea what the distances are. I don't know if it goes back into the woods back there or if it's just in, the, in this uh, grassy area. I have no clue. Maybe it's another managed prairie. So it's, you know, and there's, you know, I call that the squiggly line map. That wasn't really very helpful. And then once again, here we go. Here's us. Now, I like the fact that this one, they put the word scenic there. So 18 hole. So this is Rivermore. And by the way, does it have a pro shop? And does it have a restaurant? And does it have cart and club rentals? Well, we actually drove down there, but... Look at this sign. It's got all this blank space. It just wouldn't be that difficult to do that. Now, I know that's more than four seconds. But one thing is, we come up to that sign. We're going to turn right. Now we can stop for a couple of seconds. And we see they sell club and cart rentals, pro shop, restaurant, golf instructor, walk-ins, welcome. By the way, I'm, so I hope all that's true. I was, you know, if I would have had stints, I would have just gone out and done it for them. But, I mean, if you just, I mean, this just can't be that difficult to do. And by the way, we did go out there and we could see they had a restaurant. So once you're out there, it's fine. You know, and, and by the way, we were out there Saturday, there was a golf tournament going on. And I love the peanut gallery up here because they were giving everybody on the golf course a bad time. <laughs> Is any of you playing in that tournament? on Saturday. And so anyway, it was really funny. And the guy came up to me and, and says, I was carrying around this big old camera. And of course, they were giving these people a bad time. And, and he says, I hope you're not taking pictures of me. I said, why? And he says, because I'm a horrible golfer. And he says, well, yeah, well, how are you doing? I said, I mean, the way I play golf, if I get up to like 100, I know I'm doing really good because the bigger the number, the better you are, right? <laughs> Made him feel better. But Beautiful golf course. People were having a great time. And it was just fun. I don't know if it was a charity event or whatever. But here's another one. I found Racine County Bicycle Trail. We went online and we could find no information about anything called the Racine County Bicycle Trail. I don't know if they have other names or where you would get any information but it says bike route, motor vehicles prohibited, dogs allowed, provided, one, you know, a couple things. But I have no idea how far it goes, where it goes, what it connects to, anything. And so adding these information would be great. And by the way, is this called, is this the Seven Waters Trail? 
It is. Why doesn't the sign say seven water trail? Because we found information for seven water trail, but we had no idea where it was at. See, these are disconnects that you as locals, you know it. But if we're looking for a place to live, retire, raise a family, we don't know. But seven water trail, we found information we thought was really cool. So we, while we're here, we had to go to the Bear Den Zoo. Now, we are already laughing. You know what? It was a great little place. However, it's the only zoo in the world, and I've been to probably hundreds of them, where when you walk up to the zoo, you have to bring your attorney <laughs> to go through all of the state law notices before you even, I mean, right there you go, whoa, we're probably going to die. I mean, really? They don't do that to Racine Zoo or any other zoo on the planet, including many others in Wisconsin. I was shocked. that, And, and I, so I know that's not required, but their attorney probably said, well, you need to put that notice up there. That way you're shirking any liability and all that. And I just went, really? Can you do a Cliff Notes version? <laughs> I mean, really? And it's all in caps, you know, just make sure you get it. So, I mean, we almost like, whoa, this is bad news. But you know, it's pretty cool, actually, because there's Jane. This little fawn is two weeks old. Yeah, that's, oh, see, I told you. That, I mean, really, really cute. They had a little, uh, was it a meerkat? I can't remember which, yeah. They was jumping all over. It was just really fun. It was very hands-on. And you know what? You're never too old to be a kid, period. And I think they did a good job talking about like bobcats, talking about they're part of the Lynx family. They had good information there. I mean, kids can go and, you know, the little pygmy goats are climbing all over. The little kids are just having a great time. And it's, it's just as fun watching the kids than it is the animals. And it's fun. And you're never too old to go and see that. So overall, we gave it a good thumbs up. Now, that's kind of the outside. Now we need to kind of come into the interior. And we really thought after our, this was most of a day, we thought, you know what? This place is pretty cool. This place is pretty cool. We loved it. I mean, it was just country living. It just felt good. Um, I mean, the elementary schools look good. I mean, so we looked at schools because that's what people do. And by the way, you have to understand that visitors, people looking for a place to live, they will drive by a school building and decide whether it's good quality or not. They will do that just by the facilities. If we care about the facility. By the way, this last weekend, Friday, Saturday, the flags were all at half mass. We could not find any reason why. Do you know what was... What was it? Oh, there was an officer in Milwaukee that died. Okay, that's what. We knew it must have been something in Wisconsin because it wasn't anywhere else. So. so we just weren't sure. That was just a question I had. But the schools did look good. Um, I mean, the, the high school looked good. I, it was, um, this, by the way, just so you know, if you come down the hill, that's where the cops hide so that they can nail you when you, yeah. I didn't get nailed, but it was like, whew, I'm glad I was going up the hill. Um, we did see the hospital. Um, it looked good. I mean, so far we're seeing all the amenities we want if we lived here. And one thing in both of these towns is when you get, I mean, I love the fact that this is right next to a residential subdivision. And yet you got the big rolls of hay and here you are in Waterford. It's, you're, you're, you're right across the street. It's country living. See what I mean? So you can live in a nice subdivision like Waterford Landing and, and, and just be right there in the country. We thought it was great. Does anybody here live in Waterford Landing? Great neighborhood, see, there you go, way to go. And by the way, we look at even entrance signs like this say a lot about you. So think about that for your community gateways into the city. But nice subdivision there. And then of course, as we're driving around, we're going, okay, we want that house, right? Or we want, ooh, that one. Or we'll even take the one next door. I mean, you had some beautiful homes. You know, one thing I have to tell you, because we worked in 45 states, by the way, we lived down in Phoenix from Seattle, but down in that area. 
The thing we love so much about Wisconsin, Minnesota, is that Scandinavian heritage, every home is in use a pen. You don't find that in the South. You don't find it out West. You don't even find it in the Southeast or the Northeast. But I just love, everybody seems to care. And the houses are painted. I mean, these are just stunning. You know, and we're just picking them all out. We're actually driving around with, you know, if you go to the realtor.com app as you drive around, it'll tell you how much they are. You know, ones that are for sale. But overall, we just, we were impressed because you had just about every kind of life. Okay, is this somebody's house that's here? What's that? Is that, Bob, is that your house? That is really nice. We're just wondering, um, we could be there later tonight if you want to. Uh, <laughs> ah, that's tempting. I mean, it is stunningly beautiful, but I understand his story. How, I mean, I imagine it's, it never ends, right? Gorgeous, though. But you know, they don't all have to be, even the smaller homes were well taken care of, were nice. It just gave us a good first impression. Even homes like this had a water feature back in the entry and everything. Just really, really, really nice. So, schools were good. Medical facilities good. Recreation's good. Now it's time to look at downtowns. I hear some groaning already. <laughs> I haven't even started. First of all, downtown should be priority number one for both of your communities. Downtown should be priority number one. Here's why. The heart and soul besides, the heart and soul of any community besides its people is its downtown. As a matter of fact, if you don't hang out in your downtown, neither will visitors. We go where you go. So if you're heading to Milwaukee or Kenosha or Racine or somewhere, that's where we're going to go. And so that's really important. You need to bring your downtowns to life. And by the way, downtowns are back and in a big way. But here's the difference. The future of downtowns is never going to go back to Mayberry and leave it to Beaver. Those days are over. The future of downtowns is where we go after work and on weekends, which means you need to be open. You know what, if you live here in these two communities and heaven forbid you have to commute out of town, you come back after work and your downtowns are closed and you wonder why Amazon, did you know that 50% of all the households in America pay money to become Amazon Prime members? And in these rural downtowns, you wonder why we go to Walmart because, or Target or wherever, because they're open, and other than that, we're online. But the future of downtowns is where we go after working on weekends. That's what have, you have to change. And I understand these are mom and pa shops. They want to go home, fix dinner for the kids. But you know what? You'd be better off opening at 11 in the morning and staying open until 8 o'clock at night. Or in most countries now, they do siestas in the afternoon from like 2 to 4. You'd be better opening at 3 in the afternoon, staying home until 8, when you're, because we're at school, we're at work, we're somewhere else. And then by the time we get home, you're closed. And so, in economic development, tourism, and community development, there's absolutely, positively nothing more important than your downtown. But here's the big deal. So many downtowns sit there and they'll spend millions of dollars beautifying their downtowns, and they can still be dead as a doornail because it's what's in the buildings that makes you a draw. So there's videos you can see. So if your committees want to get together, we, we put together a whole series of these that you can use to tell you what to do and how to do it, okay? But, so we're going to start with downtown Burlington. We came in, and you have beautiful architecture. Um, we wanted to eat there. We just, our timing couldn't work, but it looked great. Just beautiful built. <laughs> Is it still in business? <laughs> well, good thing we didn't try. But the building still looks great. But it's really too bad because it is gorgeous. Okay? 
And you know, a, a couple of things is, first of all, sign should always be perpendicular to the draw. Now, there is a sign there that talks about parking. Can you read it as you're going down the street? No! Turn it sideways. That means it needs to be double-sided probably. But there it is, it's the parking rules, which is fine. And once again, I would change these to public parking down the road. I wouldn't go redo all these signs, they're beautiful signs. Um, clear to read and everything. And by the way, the, the next best thing was to be not to put it there. We're in the street. We're looking for parking space. We're not reading signs. It'd be better off if you put it in the parking lot. See what I mean? So once we pull into it, then we see the sign. Then it could be one-sided. Okay? And then, you know, and signs like this should be lower. I mean, it says park rules and it's like eight feet high. I mean, come on. When it's a pedestrian wayfinding, four feet. Four feet for signs. But it says park, pets and motorized vehicles not allowed, beer and liquor by permit, park hours are 610. That's all fine. I would have made it decorative so it's not such a municipal, you know, in your face kind of sign. Nice pots we saw. But here's what about no pets. There's Jane. I told you she was short. But see that sign? That sign is like way, way up there about no dogs. If you're going to be pedestrian, lower the signs. Um, the, and of course, you know, one thing I will tell you right off is that two hour parking is a good way to kill a downtown. So, here's the deal. In downtown Burlington, I was just out taking pictures, we were walking, we were doing all this stuff, and Jane's going, oh, your parking's going to expire, our parking's going to expire, we're going to get tickets. When people are start thinking that way, they're spending less time, they're spending less money, and that's not what you want them to do in your downtown. You know, and, and so this is, there it is. You know what the rationale is? We cannot get our employees to park somewhere else, so we're going to punish our customers instead. <laughs> How's that working for you? If I want to go in some of your shops and have lunch, that's more than two hours. And if we're sitting there doing this, looking at our watch, when are we going to run out of time? You know what? We're spending less money. And you know what? If we get a ticket, I don't know whether you enforce it or not, but if we were to get a ticket, even though we broke the lawn, we write you off. So... If you insist on two-hour parking, you need to tell us where all-day parking is. So it says parking all day straight. It looks like somebody stuck a sticker on that. But here it was two-hour parking. At least it said, by the way, all-day parking next right. And by the way, I wouldn't give arrows every direction. I would say parking next right, all-day parking next right, or four-hour parking. If you insist on two-hour parking, tell us where we can park for four hours or more. Okay? So, now... We're in downtown Burlington. You've got some great historic attractions. So the cabin is open Thursday 3 to 7, Saturday 1 to 4. Okay, so I've got to make a note of that. And by the way, we love this. Where they have a little garden there next to the cabin that talked about the plants, what they grow, and where they came from. That was really cool. Really cool, neat little hidden gem thing. So then we walk across the street at the museum. Now it's open on Sunday afternoon 1 to 4. So now, okay, we're... And then we find the Spinning Top Museum. We're not too sure when it's open, but it has some separate hours. And then we have the Logic Puzzle Museum, which has different hours. And then we've got the Chocolate Museum, which closes at 5, and it's not open on weekends when the other things are open. Or it is open on Saturdays from like 10 to 2, I think. And so we're, we're sitting there going, okay, so now, when is a good time to come and visit Burlington? Now, Monday through Friday, we have the Chaka Museum open 9 to 5. On Thursday, we could go to the cabin. On Saturday, 1.30 to 12 o'clock, the Puzzle Museum, if we call ahead and make an appointment. And 10 o'clock to 2 o'clock, the Chalk Museum's open. From 1 to 4, the cabin's open. From 1.30 to 3 o'clock, we could do the Logic Puzzle Museum, but you have to call ahead and you cannot be late. And then from 2 to 4.30, the Spinning Top Museum. Um, so we could do the logic either one of those two times. 
And so, and then, um, and so then we're sitting there going, okay, and then Sunday we can go visit the History Museum or we could go to Spinning Top Museum if we call ahead. So now we're trying to coordinate all of this. And I'm going, okay, first of all, we need to write all this down so we can get them all straight. Then we got to figure out, okay, so if we do this, so here's the idea. So we'll come out Saturday from 10 to 10.20, we're going to the Chocolate Museum. Then we'll walk over at 10.30, we'll go over to the Logic Puzzle Museum because we have to be there at 10.30 sharp. Then from 12.10 to 1.10, we could have lunch. But boy, we got to have an alarm clock going. And then, and then 1.20 to 1.50, about half an hour, we could go over to the cabin. That gives us 10 minutes to walk back to the Spinning Top Museum. By the way, there's no bathroom breaks in this schedule. <laughs> And then from 3 to 5, we can visit the shops. And by the way, we can't visit the History Museum because it's only open on Sundays. Why do you guys work together? I mean, really? But then, what about the winery? So now, this looks absolutely fantastic, by the way. We love this. Now, it's May, June, November, Saturday from 11 to 4, and Sunday from 12 to 4. Now, July and August, it's actually um, Friday, 12 to 5, Saturday, 10 to 5, Sunday, 12 to 5. Uh, but then it's September and October, so now we're saying, okay, I need to get some kind of algorithm to sort this all out. <laughs> because now I'm trying to figure out if I can squeeze, if I go back to the other one, can I squeeze them? And we miss the shops, but we might have time to run out to the winery. So I said, Jane, how far is a drive from the downtown to the winery? I think it's, what, 20 minutes? Something like that. So it's, okay, that takes 20 minutes. Can we rush out there? See what I mean? See what you're doing to people? And I just, and I just, so then I thought, okay, so now here's what we do. 10 o'clock, the Chalk Museum, 10.20, then 10.30 to 12, the Logic, Logic Puzzle Museum, be there sharp. Then we have lunch, still have lunch. Then we can go to the cabin, spinning top, two to three. I think we'll cut out a little early. Hopefully it didn't seem to be, have the, I think the other one, the Logic Puzzle Museum, you go through kind of a curriculum. And then 3.20 to 5, um, that gives us 20 minutes to drive out there. We could go to the winery, and that gives us about an hour and 20 minutes. We still can't visit the History Museum, though. <laughs> but, but I think that if you, if you could just get everybody to say, look, why don't we just be all open Saturday from 10 to 4 or something. Now, I imagine the History Museum, the same people work in the cabin, and there's only a couple volunteers, and so we have to do that on Saturday and this one on Sunday. But you know what? You make it almost impossible for anybody to enjoy the history and the culture you have in Burlington. Because the hours are so limited. And by the way, some of your businesses are just as bad. I mean, we went doors that said open and they were locked, you know, and, and so I would just, I would beg you that, you know what, if we're going to drive 45 minutes from downtown Racine and then we, we, the Chalk Museum is a 15 minute experience and then everything else is closed, you have to call for an appointment or anything, we just drove all that way and we can see one out of all, see what I mean? This is not very good. You've got to somehow sit down together and say, look. What can we do together? And if we want to bring people out here on Saturdays, at least let's just group our hours there so people can have a good experience. Because this was such a hassle that we probably say it's probably not worth, you know, we spent like two hours trying to figure all that out. And so most people wouldn't do that. By the way, beautiful park downtown, does anything ever happen here? What? The farmer's market? When is the farmer's market? Thursdays. Thursdays? What time? Oh my God, no, let me add that one down there. <laughs> I didn't have that much stuff going on Thursday, so no, I'm fine. And I'm glad, by the way, I'm glad you're doing it three to seven. That's awesome. That is the future of farmer's markets. Working to the evening hours during the dinner hour and after work. So I'm really glad you're doing that. However, why is there no sign telling us? What? Where are the banners? I didn't see any. All I saw was historic downtown banners. Did I miss them? Maybe they're not up yet? Well, we never saw. But you know what I would do? Right in the gazebo. I would hang a banner right in the gazebo. It says, 
uh, every Thursday, you know, two to, what is it, two to seven, three to seven? Three to seven, you know, uh, the Burlington Farmer's Market, right here. Just do that. It would be really easy. Because this you can't miss this, but I missed your banner somehow. Okay? But beautiful spot. And then even right here, I'd love to see you do just a calendar of events for the whole year. January, February, March, April, May. Now, you do have some things. There is a plant sale here. Um, here is a, here's the farmer's market, May 1st to October 2nd. But what happened is you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You know what happens is we somehow missed it. We didn't go and read all of them. By the way, did you know this? This is also true for retail stores. When you have more than four, three to four flyers and posters in a window, people tend to ignore them all. Three to four. Because we're going to say, well, let's read this one, then this one, then that one, then let's go over this one, then that one, then that one. And so in this case, you've got three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So what happens is nothing jumped out at us. So we missed it. And then, um, by the way, here you go. Um, and by the way, 15-minute parking? Are you nuts? What the heck is that about? Oh, that, well, it says this stall, but it doesn't say loading zone. Okay, I just thought, okay. I, by the way, this, this truck was there. Here it is, MT-917. They were there for like an hour. Just want to let you know. <laughs> I'm just I don't know how long they were there, but I'm just going, what? So, by the way, can you tell me what's in any of those shops? Food, there's food down there. But here's the thing. When we walk down the street or drive down the street, we see perpendicular signs to us. This is our vision out the car. And if I'm walking down the street, there's no incentive to walk down to that corner unless I'm really hungry. Because I don't even know what kind of food. All I know is sell food. There's no, there's no blade signs. And so here's the case in this. Can you tell me what's in these shops? Well, obviously not much is in this one. But I don't know what's in that corner one. I don't know what's in this one. And I'm right in front of them. You know, I mean, even right here, if you had blade signs, you wouldn't need all these sandwich boards. You know, and by the way, if I want to know what's in tiz, Tizens, Sizens, Itzens, whatever. It's an IT, Itzens. So, and by the way, do they own the next shoe store that's going out of business? Okay, but that's really confusing. You've got two shoe stores right next to each other. But only way I could see that sign is if I go out in the street. Because it's above the awning. It's too high. And so, and so the thing is, there's hardly any blade signs. And this one here, Alice, Al, I love that, Alice in Wonderland. That's a really great name. Does somebody here own that store? Great job. That's just really great. My, and it's a really nice store. However, I only see that sign if I'm across the street. See what I mean? If you just had a little blade sign just hanging just right up there that just said imported toys and games, all the difference in the world. Great shop. And so even right here, this one right here, another great shop downtown, I only see it across the street. There's no blade signs. And so in downtown Waterford, okay, it's your turn. Down to Waterford, can you tell me? I can see the jewelers. I have no idea what's in this block. You know, and, and I mean, I could see, you know, title insurance there as I'm walking past, you know, but I don't see. And then, you know, right here, they did a good job. And by the way, look at the beautification. You know, and we did see the cafe sign. You can see the cafe sign right there. And so... We'd love to see your merchants get together and do a blade sign buying co-op. This is blade signs. Notice one thing about these blade signs. Chocolate, collectibles, train, restaurant. It's really easy to tell what they're selling. But you also know something else. They're consistent in height. They don't all have to be cookie cutter same size. You could have round ones, oval ones, rectangle ones. It doesn't matter. But this is Nantucket. I mean, this is Carmel, California. The best towns have blade signs. And by the way, to make it really easy, 
no lower than seven feet, no higher than nine feet, which means they can't be any taller than 24 inches, and no wider than 42 inches would be perfect. That's Canmore, Alberta there. Do blade signs, your business will increase. But if you go together as merchants or a downtown association or whatever and work, a lot of times they'll give you like, look, if we have 10 people buying blade signs, we'll give everybody like a third off. I've seen sign companies actually do that. And, and so that's something you really need to do in both these towns. You know, here, uh, this one here, I can't tell whether it says Super Tacos up there, but then it says Certified Public Accountant, so I can't tell whether the accountant is serving food <laughs> between tax returns. I don't know where the accountant is in there, um, but it looks more like the taco shop. So there's some signs are like confusing like that. By the way, where is there really an accountant in that restaurant? Are they upstairs or something? Or oh, there's a little indoor mall there somewhere. Okay. Well, confusing to us. Um, now look, this high street, easy. Now where it says artistic fi fibers, if they were to put fine yarns, or is that what it says? Yeah, fine yarn in bigger letters. That's the Lord to pull people in. Always use what to pull people in before the name of the store. But once again, there's the salon, uh, life choice, not too sure this, but jewelry I can see. Um, so those, they do a pretty good job. And then there we go again. <laughs> you, have, you have to know what kind of yarn you want. Run in there and say, I got 12 minutes. I need four things of yarn, you know. So anyway. Always promote the year. Now, this is the mercantile. I'm trying to figure out, it says bridal here, and there's a bridal dress there. But up here, it looks like women's fashions. But a mercantile means they sell all different kinds of merchandise. So we walk in, and we can't figure this place out. There doesn't seem to be any retail on the ground floor at all. So I don't know where the mercantile is. There are some steps going up there. So I don't know whether that's the bridal shop or women's fashions, or I'm assuming this is a bridal shop and women's fashions. Is that right? It is? Okay. But it says mercantile. Where's the rest of the mercantile? That's the origin of the building? You know what? You're hurting this poor person's business. <laughs> really? Whose business? Is that yours? 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 I mean, you have a fantastic store, but having mercantile is misleading. If, if, uh, you know what I would say? I would say right here, put women's fashions and bridal shop. What's that? Okay, so there's an event venue. How would anybody even know that? See what I mean? We want, we want your businesses to succeed, and I think it hurts your business. You know, maybe, it, maybe if that sign didn't say mercantile, and it just said uh, uh, bridal and women's fashions um, and special events. You know, I mean, that right there would make it really clear what you are, what you're selling. We could see in the windows that you sold women's fashions, but we were confused by the bridal and whether you're in the same, and we're confused because a mercantile is a place that sells all kinds of stuff. Yeah. And so I think it, I think it does your business disservice. Now, your locals are going to know, but what about us visitors that are coming in because we're here to find all that chocolate <laughs> or whatever it is you're known for? See what I mean? So, um, now even this, beautiful facility, but we had no clue what it was. So we thought Veterans Terrace, when you see words like terrace, it sounds like retirement, like Shady Pines, you know? <laughs> so we thought, okay, it must be retirement living, but it doesn't look like residential. We had no idea this was this beautiful venue we're in right now. This is stunning. Had no idea it was an event space until we came in tonight. And so that's the other thing about signs. Now, back to Waterford. So we tried to find Main Street, Main Street Boutique here. It just closed. Okay. okay. 
It just closed. Okay, so that just closed. And by the way, we were there on Saturday. Is that right, Gene? I think we were there on Saturday. Uh, there's a big, huge sign in the window that says open. And, and by the way, it was absolutely locked up. So, you guys are really mean, you know? It, we have all these expectations, you know? And, and so, by the way, we love... Does anybody in either of these two towns sell these balloons? Who? The flower shop. Oh, the flower shop in Waterford? Oh, my gosh. We want some of those, so we got to, you know, we, we need to connect. Those are so cool. Well, I hope merchants everywhere would just hang in those, how they spin and everything. Fantastic draws attention. Thought they were the coolest thing ever. I would love to see a little sign in the window that says, if you like the balloons, the decor. What, you call them balloons, right? You just say, if you like the decorative balloons, go to the flower shop. I think it's like one door down. But just pretty cool. And then, by the way, I would always add 24-hour visitor information here because we did see the Chamber of Commerce is in there. It says it's open, but it wasn't. Um, and, and so what you need is, see that? That's like a $10 real estate brochure holder. So if there's, by the way, we could find no printed information about Waterford. Do you have any? You do? What do you have? A little booklet? Couldn't find it. It's in Village Hall. Well, you know what? What happens if we're there on the weekend? See what I mean? So here's what you can do. If you just get one of those and just put it outside the chamber office, I think it would be great. This is in Mahone Bay in Nova Scotia. They did like those little mailbox things. So these are things you could do pretty inexpensively. Um, this is in North Platte, Nebraska. I thought this was really cool. It's my favorite one of all of them. But it's a little metal anodized aluminum, and they have like their state guide, their local, you know, um, you can do the county guide, the state guide, and then your brochure right there, whatever you've got. Um, and they paid like $300 for that, and it's custom made. Um, over in Burlington, they did this outside their chamber. So if you do whatever you can do to get us some information um, would be great. So and it doesn't have to be expensive, but that way, and I'm glad to see the chambers in there. So you're making use of empty space, what used to be a boutique, right? So that's good. Um, so anyway, I thought that was really good what they did. Now, next up, look at that. 70% of first time sales come from curb peel. We all travel. Have you ever said these exact words? That looks like a nice place to eat. We judge the book by the cover, fair or not. And so, and so in this case, that is gorgeous. I think this is in Waterford, right? No, is that in Burlington? I started to get them mixed up after I was, but, but I just thought that was so cute with the little birdhouse there with the little water spigot. And, and, and I just think people, you have to understand that people gravitate towards these. Now the music store, you know, I gave them, you know, we have one, two, three, including the one that's for tonight. But you know, what happens is once we see, you know, one, 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 oh yeah, and by the way, we've got another one up there, another one, so we have one, two, three, four, five, six, plus the two on the door. And by the way, we got there, we took this just before they opened. It uh, looks like a great store, but once again, this was just about how many, how many flyers that you can put in a window. So if somebody comes by and says, we got this guy, Roger Brooks, coming to town, would you hang up this flyer? What you need to say, then which one do you want us to take down? See what I mean? And so th that's, that's the problem, because you can't just plaster your windows full of flyers. Okay? Um, great job here. Um, by the way, I'm a huge proponent of putting window displays into exterior spaces. Like you see with the clothes hanging there, but you would never put a clothes rack in your window so you don't put it outside. Unless... Now, these, if they're special, like 50% off, then that makes sense. Or you're doing a garage sale weekend. But what you always want to do, like this thing here, this is really decorative. But I really think that, as a matter of fact, I want to show other people because I think this is really awesome, doing this, doing this, doing this. This here is what I try to avoid if I can. But at least this one here is decorative. And, and there is a mannequin on the end piece. So it does make it so it works. So, but it's a good job. It tells me they're in business. 
and it tells me they're trying to pull people in the door, so they do a good job. Um, fantastic job here. Uh, there's Jane being my model. Um, you know, with the flower pots, a couple of cha a chair, and, and a couple of chairs and a little table, just adds life and makes it seem welcoming. You ever wonder why people put porch swings or a couple of rock chairs on the front porch? They may never sit them, but you know what it does? It makes their home feel welcoming. It's the same with retail. And that's what you have to understand. Now, this is in Burlington, right? This place, we, we, had to, we got kind of confused at this intersection. <laughs> so are you thinking, boy, that guy is stupid. You're going, yeah, we get it. <laughs> but there, this, this whole thing was full of people. By the time we got there, they had kind of cleared out. But you know what happens in a place like this? When we see one person out there eating ice cream, other people go, we gotta do it too. And so, but once again, they do a good job. They got flower pots, they got garbage receptacles right there, we got colored chairs there. I mean, they did a really good job and that place was busy and yes, we went there and bought custard. And by the way, I would have loved to see some tables and chairs in the back. I don't know if they're gonna put those out, but they've got the flower pots there. They thought, just put a couple tables and chairs out there too. But they do a really good job. Now, Waterford's ice cream place? <laughs> it's just asphalt. I mean, there's just no, and by the way, if you got a reader board, use it for crying out loud. You know, if you have a special, this week's special chocolate, anything. I'm just going, I, sometimes I think businesses don't care. Or they, they walk in the back door. Now they do have a couple picnic tables here and over there, but they're just on like, what on parking spaces. It just doesn't have any kind of curb appeal. I mean, if it was me, I would have actually put pots like right, right here, right here, right here. I would have just lined this whole thing with pots. You know, just, just to add some color, anything. And by the way, we saw a lot more people in the other one than we saw in this one. And it was the same weekend. And yeah, I know Burlington's a little bigger, but there was a lot of people in Waterford walking around. But it, it just didn't have any kind of curb appeal. Now, this, the little, is this the coffee shop? It does a great job. As a matter of fact, I guess I'll be there tomorrow afternoon. Um, and, and I mean, it's just a great, you could see, this is where people hang out. Is it? Yeah. It is, and it's great. They do a really good job. Now, this is the power of curb appeal. And this is what I mean by extending window displays to exterior spaces. This merchant, every morning, spends probably 15 or 20 minutes putting those things out there. You know, I don't know why more restaurants don't do that. That's like $300. I mean, that's pretty cute. You know, I mean, this is Canmore, Alberta, a small town, you know, and look at that. The merchant goes to all the trouble every single morning to put out the mannequin and all of those things. Because you have some places that have vacancies, we don't know whether they're in business or not. Like if we, we walked up to a business where the doors are locked, if we would have went to that restaurant that's now closed, this tells us, it makes it obvious that you're open and in business. Look at that. That's in Canmore, Alberta. I mean, this is Laverne, Minnesota. You know, and, and so it's just not that expensive to do. And by the way, neither of these places sell food. They do it because it makes it seem welcoming. So for your merchants, I want you to pass this on. Extend window displays. By the way, merchants should always have 24 to 30 inches outside their storefronts. If you have city telling you you can't do it, then they need to change the bylaw, the ordinances. And by the way, blade signs, benches, facade appeal, window display, sidewalk dining umbrellas. This is Nina, Wisconsin. Now this is before, look. City takes care of the curbside. Merchant should take care of the facade side. Before, after. See, you just, I just heard that, whoa. Retail sales went up 30 percent just by doing that to that that is the power of beautification but you know what you could do I love this this is Fredericksburg Texas they did a cool thing what they did is they said they wanted to beautify the storefronts but they didn't really have 
a lot of money. So what they did is they went down the row of businesses on both sides of their main street. And they said, look, we want to go get some pots. And we're going to go to a nursery at the end of the season. We'll take whatever they got, as long as the opening was 21 inches or bigger. So they, want, they didn't want little pots. They said, would you donate some money? So like one merchant gave them 20 bucks. I think the average was like 40 bucks. Um, somebody gave them 200 bucks. They took the money over to a wholesale nursery, like 20 miles away. And they said, at the end of the season, we want all your pots. Even if they have chips, they have hairline cracks, or if you only have one pot, doesn't match another, we'll take whatever you got, but we want you to sell it to them for pennies on the dollars. And we'll just get it. So they did that. They brought back a bunch of pots on a flatbed truck. They sent them in a side street, and they said, merchants, help yourself. They didn't say, you only pay $20, you only get one. They just said, help yourself. So you could see that this merchant grabbed these that kind of look similar. This merchant grabbed these. This merchant grabbed these. The white ones kind of down there. Um, another merchant grabbed these two tall ones. Then what they did is they went and put 15 yards of topsoil in a side street and some gravel and some landscape fabric. And they went to youth organizations that were trying to raise money. Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts. I guess they're all just scouts now. Scouts. They went to band, cheerleaders, football, any youth organization trying to raise money and said, look, we want you to put rock in the bottom of each pot, put a thing of landscape fabric, and then fill them full of topsoil. This is like October. Now, this is Texas, so it's a little easier than you are, but, but they did that. Okay, and you know what? So the kids did that. They did that, but it was now wintertime, and so they put in all these pots pinwheels. It made the national news all the pinwheels, you know, because they didn't plant them. And then in the spring, they made sure they planted them with three quarters of the plantings were evergreens. But here's the thing. Because they never had one case of vandalism because kids protect things they take ownership of. It works. Not one case. And in the spring, they planted them. There were some pots left over. Now notice this one, blade sign, beautification, Makes you want to go in, doesn't it? That's what your merchants should do. And then, by the way, I want you to take a look at this next photograph. What do you see? You see the men on the benches. Guess where the wives are? Shopping. That was not posed. That was not set up. Look. I have just two words for you. Think benches. You know, this is Cedar City, Utah, but you know what? You could this that bench is probably a few hundred dollars, but you know, you can go to Lowe's. I don't know if you have Ace Hardware, Home Depot, whatever you got, you can buy nice benches for $79. And then put a pot on both sides. And always, your benches should always be at the facade facing out. Okay? Now, you know, so when I see these benches, I'm going, put that against the facade and flank it with pots because Zumpano's doesn't look that great. It's got a great sign. It's probably a great restaurant, but there's zero curb appeal. I think the town or the city has done a good job with all the baskets, but what are the merchants doing? And so I think that that can work. Um, I just think that, you know, benches should always be the facade facing out. Now, Every time I come to Wisconsin and Minnesota and these places, I say, Ben Raj, you don't know what it's like in the winter. Okay. This is Port Elgin in Ontario in the middle of December. All they do is the annuals and the flowers are gone. They put in the boughs. You know, I mean, they put in dried flowers. This is Erin, Ontario. These are little towns. And this is in the winter. And yeah, they have, you know, they shovel the snow around them when they get it. Some of these have awnings, so it's okay. But look at what they've done. There's just no excuse for not pulling customers in your door. And beautification, remember what I said, 70% of first-time sales. Once we're there, we get it. But that first time, we judge the book by the cover. I mean, isn't that cool for a women's fashion shop? Wow. So, when we see rows of shops like this, we see two little pots there, it's just not enough. 
It just doesn't add any appeal. It doesn't, plus there's no blade signs. I don't even know what's there. You know, and then, you know, like here, it did a great job. I would love to see two pots, three pots. See what I mean? So you have enough that just, wow. But that's a good job. And I love the flags and this, by the way, these little things that motion like the, like those uh, balloons, things like those are great. They get attention. Great shop there, by the way. And so, you know what? Look, you have a welder supply company does a better job than most of your retailers. <laughs> really? And he's not even catering to women. I mean, look at that. That's gorgeous. And your restaurants don't do it? So... Okay, here we go. There's the floor shot that sells the balloons, right? I gotta make a special trip there. Isn't that fantastic? I mean, it's just incredible. And by the way, all your buildings don't have to be brown, beige, and gray. Add some color. That's gorgeous. People say, oh, it's a historic downtown. They didn't have that color back. You know what? Sometimes we let, we kill ourselves. And so I just think that's fantastic. You know what? We saw this cafe, we made a special trip back out here from downtown Racine to eat at that cafe. Yeah, is that your cafe? Okay, you were there, yeah. She was there. It's great, she does a great job. I mean, number one, she's got the tables, the chairs, the flowers. Um, okay, here you go. We come around the side, you've got that. We just, and by the way, it was fantastic. I love, okay, this, I'm giving you some, you need to go out and help some other merchants around town. But even like the, the little branches you did here with the lights on the back of the coffee station, fantastic. I mean, we were just in there, so, um, um, and we were there, was it Saturday or Sunday? I can't remember which day. Um, but anyway, it's just fantastic, just really great. You've done an excellent job. You really set the standard. So, yeah. So, um, and, and the food was great too. And so I just thought, you know, uh, we actually went, I mean, this is, I mean, look at these. Why do not more of them do it? And by the way, this is not so easy in Waterford because the whole downtown is pretty much under construction. And for them to do that, it takes, you know, it takes a lot of work and a lot of effort. But like this place, this is in Waterford too, right? Is it in business? would never know that it's in business. I mean, I can see Help Wanted there, but I don't know where that Help Wanted sign's been there for six months. There's not one shred of anything that tells me they're in business. So, if I went back there now, I'd probably not be let in, right? <laughs> but, you know, and we did go over the bridge, um, over the river, um, there's no blade signs down here either. Uh, there's one way down there. I have no idea what's in these shops. Um, these are all these, you know, and then by the way, this little, I love this, this little, you know, this little corner, these little, I got an idea for you. What's that? The little loop? The loop, that's called the loop, okay. Well, you know, um, I sat there and I looked at this and I went, Oh man, I have an idea. What if, by the way, I'm gonna talk about millennials for a minute. When I turned 16, that day I was down getting my driver's license. You bet. Everybody did back in those days. Did you know that 70% of millennials don't even have a driver's license? The average age of a millennial getting a driver's license is in their 20s. Number one, they're one of the first generations to start life in a mountain of debt, college, you name it. I mean, they can't afford to buy a house, buying a car. And so, you know what? All three generations, us boomers, the boomers were the ones that were the first ones when they deregulated airlines that we went to Europe. We saw all these towns with piazzas, all with pedestrian walkways. And then the, then the, the Gen Xers, the people in there now in their 40s, early 50s, you know what, they were the ones who went backpacking around Europe, right, during college days. And the millennials, they don't even, they want out of their cars and pedestrian experience. In America, we built our culture around the automobile, that is changing. Even in New York City, they have shut down 60 miles of lanes of traffic 
and turned them into pedestrian walkways. And it's no longer even the, con the most congested city in America. So I thought, what if, what if you, there's like 20 parking spaces there. What if you turn this into a plaza? So, so what you do is you put in paver stones, right? Instead of asphalt, you just put paver stones in there. You turn them in plazas. And by the way, you could even put bollards at each end right here so that you could allow delivery vehicles until like 1030 in the morning. See what I mean? So they can still have access. You still would have emergency access. But what if you made that all pedestrian? What if that was paver stones? What if you already got most of the street trees, but what if you finished and you put street trees on both sides? Right? And in the winter, you just light those up. And then what if you put those yellow things are Catalina umbrellas, like 10-foot umbrellas that you would have chairs and tables under? I mean, that doesn't mean some of these might be restaurants. Some might change to restaurants. But what if you had all those tables and chairs? See those white squares? Those are like vendor booths. So what if we added a couple vendor booths and we added some more vendor booths? And so during kinds of events, you could do all these kinds of things. What if we even put a portable stage down there at that end and then we could allow some more tables and chairs there? You could have little bands, concerts, or even just movies on the square. Wouldn't that be the coolest place ever? Just by doing that, you'd have people saying, I want to live here and have this great little pedestrian place. And by the way, if you ever have a merchant come and say, you take away the parking in front of my store, you're going to kill my business. Here's your response. Are you telling me your business isn't worth walking a block for? Give you another statistic. The average person that shops at Walmart parks 140 to 160 feet away from the front door. That's average. Yet they have no problem walking that 160 feet into the store and all the way to the back, which is further than the back of this room, to buy a DVD or Blu-ray. They just walk two blocks. This is the future. I mean, you do that, it'd be pretty cool. I just think that would be a really awesome, cool little district. And over time, I'd like to see, I think there might be an insurance agency. I can't remember what all was in there. I thought, wouldn't it be, over time, there might be little restaurants, boutiques, you know. It's just a cool little place. And, and it's just, I, I just think it's worth the walk then. You know, I mean, over here, it's just pause. Is this still in business? No, okay. I didn't think so. It looked like it's been. But even that, I thought, even if that was a cool little restaurant, can you imagine if you created a little plaza out there, you fill it full of tables and chairs, and you had a little restaurant in there? What a cool little hangout place, a little bar. You put the rope lights, you know what I mean? You ever seen those, the rope outdoor lights out there? You have these kind of opportunities that are already here. Put a little stage at one end. And you know what you do is like on that street, I showed you where vendor booths are. But you know what? You can buy these things at Amazon for like $495. So you get a bank to sponsor three big chess sets and you put them in your little plaza area. I mean, you might have checkers. You might buy Jenga sets. You know Jenga's, the blocks you pull out? They're like, these are like four feet tall. They're 80 bucks. All you have to do is in this space is activate it. Chess, checkers, Jenga. I mean, you, whatever. You could even put in some, some more permanent chess tables. You know, like this. That's in Nashville, North Carolina. Or even foosball tables. Even, you can even put in during the summer, you might even put in bocce ball courts. These are all, you can do these that are portable. Or even bring in a couple little food trucks and trailers. You could even bring in, have a, a vendor come in with a portable climbing wall. And they charge kids a couple bucks, they're making some money, and you, you're activating those shops in that space. You know, this is in Indianapolis. You know, that's portable. You can see it's got seating areas, they can move it wherever they want. You know, wouldn't it be cool if in that square, you, even in that little, the loop, is that what you call it? The loop. In the loop, you know, if you did, this is called Imagination Playground. They're like Lincoln Logs, for anybody that remembers Lincoln Logs, but they're made out of foam. Wouldn't it be cool to have a couple of sets of these and you put them in there?
So you know what you could do is every month it could change. In the winter, in Canmore, Alberta, you know what they do in the winter? If they don't have snow, they blow snow into their street and they have people actually cross-country ski on it. Not a whole lot of cross-country skis in the loop, but, but isn't this cool? And at the end of the day, you, you see these, they put them in these bins. And, and or you can get these sets like this where these just close right up. Can you imagine? I mean, we've even been in towns, for you, I even thought, could a brand be healthy living? Because you have all these sports facilities, you have all the trails, you got the river, you know, and I even thought, this is in Canmore, Alberta, they did an outdoor fitness park in the middle of winter. They're all wearing ski gear, and they're out there using these year-round. You're close to Lake Geneva and all that, right? They got skiing. And so I thought, man, you can do something like that. But these are things that you could change. You know, this is in Long Beach. They took six parking spaces. They said, okay, we're going to move the parking back. They painted everything yellow and brown. Then they added yellow tables and chairs and umbrellas. And they brought in food trucks. And at lunch, they might have a speaker or a comedy act or somebody. And they did it just temporarily. It never reopened. People said, no, we, we, we're fine losing the parking. So, and by the way, I wanted to show you this. This is in front of a shopper's drug mart. Now, what do you think shopper's drug, and, and a bank, shopper's drug mart and a bank, and there are some other shops in there. You see kind of sign, there are some other shops back in here. Now, what if I was to say, we want you to lose all of that parking? You think they'd be upset? Yeah. Darn straight they were. But you know what? They tried it. And that's it in the summer and during the winter, that's an ice skating rink and it never ever reopened back up for parking because it was unfounded. Their worries about you take away the parking and kill my business was unfounded. It was worth walking a block for. It's the same with you. So, just saying, you have a stunning boardwalk. This needs to be programmed. I mean, those chess sets, Jenga blocks, you, you don't, you need it. You have places you can activate and there's nothing going on on them. And it's June. And maybe you do flower and garden shows. I mean, I could think of a whole list of cool things you could do in these places. And by the way, um, you know, I think you need to have sidewalk cafe dining. You know, because right here we've got like a cigarette thing and a bench. I mean, that really makes you want to go in. And by the way, one thing that I got, a crack, I got a kick out of was that if you go here to John's main event, you get Burlington's best burgers. The problem is, like two doors down, you can get the world's best burgers. <laughs> so why would you settle for Burlington's best burgers? <laughs> yeah, well, <clears throat> so... I would love to see right here, you know, there's Flippy's fast food. You know, I'm not so sure I'd put fast food in your title. You know what I mean? But Flippy's, I think it's a great name, but why aren't there any tables and chairs? And so I do think this is something you should do. If I go back to Canmore, Alberta, they allow merchants to do this. I mean, sometimes it's just as simple as that. And by the way, here's an ice cream shop. And when you have people sitting out there, her sales skyrocket. And I said, you know what? I went into a similar shop like this, and I said, you know, ma'am, there were kids out there. And I said, I would give those kids free ice cream and let them sit out there all day. She goes, that's what I do. <laughs> then she goes, actually, I give kids one free ice cream cone. They do need to sit in those chairs. And you know what? Their moms love my store, and every single time they do that, there is a line of people coming in the store. And in the case that I went in, they didn't, she didn't even sell ice cream. It was home accents. She had a little ice cream bar. It was just a way to get people in her store. I said, but they're in your home accent store. Most people say, no food or drink allowed. I said, how does that work for you? You're selling ice cream. They're walking around in your home accent. She goes, every once in a while, I have an accident. But you know what? 70% of my non-ice cream sales come because I sell ice cream. It's worth it. So, you know, all these, these are just simple little things that you could do. You know, I mean, this one here is in Salem, Massachusetts. Those are silk flowers. That was in April. It's just really simple and inexpensive. But you know what you could do? 
some of your sidewalks aren't wide enough. This is in Nelson, British Columbia, population 5,000. They actually let merchants take up a parking space to allow outdoor dining. Now, I took that picture in October. They were just getting ready to take it down for the winter. But these are all little sidewalk cafes. This is in Nelson, British Columbia. They took up parking spaces for that. And so, I mean, look at how simple that is. I don't know how they get away with it. And I said, you know what? You've got a big trip hazard there. He said, you know what? We've never had a complaint. We do tell people, watch your step. And, and so it's just that organic. Now, I think this is even better. This is Wolfville, Nova Scotia. What they do is the dining is up here against the building, and they allow pest pedestrians to walk around. That's what you could do. Yeah, you lose a parking space or two, but you know what? They have reflectors on there. And it's a non-slip surface. And you can see where storm drainage still allowed to do that. And by the way, in Wolfville, Nova Scotia, they share a warehouse. And during the winter months, they just put them all in the warehouse. And then in the spring, they bring them back out. How cool is that? Number one, it slows traffic. Number two, it gets people's attention. Number three, it increases retail sales or restaurant sales dramatically. I mean, how cool is that? You know, this is Barrie, Ontario. See, they just put that one up, it was brand new. But you see where they had the reflectors? And you see where it's all ADA compatible, so you can get wheelchairs, everything you can do that. I took this early in the morning, they weren't even open yet. But how cool is that? I think you need to do that. You know, even here where they had to work around a fire hydrant. You know, that's cool stuff. But you know, this, I just thought, you need to do, you need to bring, you have a beautiful, beautiful downtown, bring it to life. It's June. July, August, September. You know, even here, you got the brew house on the corner. Um, you got a row of chairs and one little tiny table. How does that, that doesn't make any sense. But it's a start. You know, we actually had lunch here at, is it Napoli or Napoli? Yeah. Napoli. It was really great food, but it doesn't have a stitch of curb appeal. You know why we ate there? Because TripAdvisor said it was great. See, if we can't trust your curb appeal, we have to go online and figure out whether we made a good choice. And it was really good. But you wouldn't know it from outside. I would love to see this downtown. I always, say, I always want to see shops out there. I'm going, no, 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 we need you downtown. And I would love to see it if they rented bikes. Wouldn't that be cool? You got the trail systems. You got everything. So, in closing, you know what? At the end of the day, um, we, oh yeah, we also saw this out there. Was that near Browns Lake? Yes. Yeah, it looked like a great place. Is it still in business? Yes. Now, I knew it was in business, but you know how I knew? Right there. When you see flowers and stuff, you know they had to be taken care of, and you know it's in business. And that's the same with your downtown businesses. I mean, this helps. The door's actually open right there. You know, we did see Marty's. It looks like a nice place. Um, I love, by the way, Pyramidella shrubs, that's what these are called, are fantastic. Um, they're great. They're evergreen. And, and putting those in front of your businesses is, is a great thing to do. We also saw docks uh, on the Fox, beautiful flowers and everything. Um, that looked like a really good place to eat. We also saw Glassworks. I wish it was in downtown. Now, we were out there on Saturday. It was closed for the day for some reason, an event or something. Um, but it looks really great. I mean, once again, um, it looked like a great place to go. We did see the antique mall, which okay. And you know, one of our best things about Waterford, it seems to be the only place in Racine County, except for the one I just learned about in Racine, that actually rents boats, kayaks, and canoes. Way to go, Waterford! That means we'll skip over Burlington to go to you. <laughs> See, this is me pitting town against towns. And by the way, I think you two could market together because you each have different products and you're, what, six miles apart or something? I mean, I think you two should market together. I think you do really well because you each offer different things. But I was really glad to see that. Um, but at the end of the day, we just thought it was just both these towns were like, wow, after if you know what, if I was getting a job in this area, in Racine County somewhere, and I wanted more of a country lifestyle, absolutely, this is where we'd come. 
Now, we didn't assess every other small town in the county, but it was just something about the feeling, the people were nice. It was just the, the I mean, there was, you could tell places like this look like they're really nice. And by the way, that one actually had patio dining overlook in the, I mean, it's just, just that kind of that feeling. One thing I really like about both of these towns is it's an intimate setting. It's not big, it's not brash, it's not, we're not trying to be, we're not trying to be uh, pretentious or anything. It's, this is who we are, and I thought it was awesome. Um, I think that what you have, I mean, even the Malthouse Theater um, looked like a really cool place. I'm not sure what they show or when or how it works. But even just that, it even looked like a really cool, organic uh, place to spend time or see theater. Even the bike racks I thought were cool. So, one thing you need to do. What is your unique selling proposition, Waterford? What is it? What, what sets you apart from all the other cities and towns in Racine County, let alone the state of Wisconsin? Same with Burlington. What is your brand? And remember, brand is not a logo. It's what people think of you. We say, oh, I'm from Burlington. What do they say? Burlington Coat Factory? I mean, there's lots of, almost every state has a Burlington. And so, but what is it? Is it chocolate? What is it? For both of you, what is your unique selling proposition? Why should I move? Why should I invest? Why should I visit you? What is it? You know? And, and then the, the next thing to do is what sets you apart from the other 593 cities and towns in Wisconsin? If we wanted to work at Foxconn, you have what, Kansasville, Is, did I get that right? You've got, you've got what, 11, 11 cities and towns in the county? Is that right, Dave? 17 cities and towns just in your county. But then there's also Kenosha, there's also Milwaukee, there's also Madison, there's lots of places around you. What sets you apart? Is it art? Is it music? Is it food? Is it recreation? And by the way, you can't use recreation. Everybody has recreation. This is Wisconsin. And everybody seems to have a Fox River. <laughs> and so, and while you're working on that, I want you to create an assessment team. So you have 72 of these little suggestions. Other than wayfinding, and maybe putting pavers in that little, in the loop, if you decided to put paver stones in there, you know, because you don't want to do it on asphalt, that way you can make it all even so you don't have trip curbs and all that. You know what? Other than that, you could probably do all of this stuff for like $30,000, all of it. It's all low-hanging fruit. Most of her things businesses need to do. I mean, wayfinding is not so cheap, but you could hand out assignments, then turn some of these suggestions. Some of these you may say, well, Roger, we're already working on them. Some of them you may say, Roger, you know, we don't like it. That's okay. They're just suggestions. This whole assessment is meant to be a conversation started to get you going. You know, and you might take some of these and do these, but most of them are low-hanging fruit. One of the reasons Dave had us come to do this in June is, is so that we could see you in the peak season. The last couple of days didn't help with all the rain. But here's the thing, is if I live, you know, I just did pull demographics earlier today. Within a five mile radius of Main Street and State Street in Racine, so right on the waterfront, five mile radius, which half of it's in the lake. You have 120,000 people. Why should any of those 120,000, and that, by the way, that doesn't even get us to 94. You need to give people in that side of the county a reason to come to Waterford and Burlington. I know a lot of times in rural communities you think, well, they get all the glory. I mean, it's real Racine. You know, everything is about Racine, 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 Racine. And I hear it in Milwaukee. I hear it, I hear it everywhere except Wisconsin Dells, and that's where Baraboo complains. <laughs> right? I mean, somebody's always, they get all the glory. You know, but, but what, you, what you have to understand is what do you have? That's your unique selling process. Why should I come? I even thought... Could you do a really cool farmer's market out here between these two towns or in one of the two towns? A big one that would outdo Kenosha where Racine goes. 
you know, you could do that. You're in farm country. But whatever it is, Dave is, he, he, he fit 90% of the cost for us coming out here to help you. So even though he may say, yeah, but he's on that side and he represents the whole county and he really has in his heart, give us a reason to come out there. You have chocolate, that's three days a week. I mean, does it even last the three days the whole weekend? But what about the other 362 days of the year? That's what you need to work on. And then if we come out, I got to tell you one thing I didn't show up here, but about 25% of the doors in your two towns that were commercial businesses that said they were open, the doors were locked. And a lot of them were locked. It says we're open 9 to 5 and we're there at 1 o'clock in the afternoon and they're locked. If you want visitors to come and live here, move here, or just come and spend time money here, you got to make it easier. Like all those museum hours. And we had a kick putting that together. It wasn't easy. So, that's what you need to do. You know, I, I think this is about making something happen. And, you know, one of my favorite sayings is this, the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The best, second best time is today. I'm going to give Dave, you're recording this. Hopefully it'll be on YouTube. It could be on Town's website. It could be wherever you want. We're recording it. He's going to get all the slides. We're going to do a report for you that has all this stuff in it. And I hope you'll do this because you really do have real country living out here. I'm not saying that's your brand, but I think what you got is pretty darn cool. So with that, does anybody, I'll take just a few minutes, to answer a couple of questions if you have them. And I don't mind the hard ones. And by the way, some people may say, well, you didn't show my business or you didn't show that business. It's because I was trying to keep within my time frame, but I photographed, I took 600 and some photos in this county. So, so hopefully there's enough in here for inspiration. I think you have two wonderful communities. I think you need to think forward. I think you need to think about foreign people starting to live here. I think your youth would love to come back, you know, once they go to college and if you have the job opportunities. I think the job opportunities are here, and you just need to work on your quality of life. Young people and young families like things to do after six, and we're not talking bars. We're just talking life. Make sense? Yes. At the very beginning on one of the slides, one of the things you said was restrooms. Yes. And you haven't spoken about it since, but did you ever find a public restroom? No. <laughs> so what do you recommend? Every, so just so you know, here's my little sound bite for you. Relieved visitors spend more. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. Think about this. McDonald's has a policy of never putting on their doors for customers only or no public restrooms, like some of your businesses do. You know why? Because 80% of the people that go into McDonald's that use the restroom buy something. Half out of guilt. guilt. They call it guilt sales. <laughs> we use the restroom, we better buy something. And the other half out of impulse. While we're here, let's get something to eat. Let's get something to drink. Absolutely, you should have public restrooms. Now, you cannot do public restrooms that are in the village hall or town thing that close at 5. If we're coming downtown to hang out after work on weekends, they need to be open. By the way, public restrooms should always be in the heart of the spending district. If you're where people can spend money, you won't have vandalism because there are people around. So you should do it. Now, building standalone restrooms can be expensive, like $130,000. And these days you have to have like, you know, men, women, or whatever you decide. You know, that's kind of a problem. But we found in experiences where they say, well, we're going to do single stall restrooms. You know what I'm talking about, where there's just one person at a time. One challenge they have, because there, then it doesn't matter what you are you know, whether you're men, women, or how you identify yourself these days. The problem with those is that we found in studies is that sometimes those restrooms create illicit behavior because they go in there and they're like themselves, where if you have multiple stalls, you can't get away because there's other people coming in and out. So that's kind of a challenge, but you need to have them. I didn't see them in either downtown. Now, in Burlington, we, we kept thinking, okay, the, the does the chamber in Burlington 
Is there anybody here from the chamber? Do you have public restrooms when you're open? We allow people to use their restrooms. Yeah, you allow people. Yeah, and that's another problem. Not everybody can just, your restrooms have to have state standards and everything. But the problem is you close at five. So somewhere these towns do need that, yes. Um, you know, and, and I don't know, now on the water, there's a, it looked like a little shelter thing, and I think that might have had public restrooms in it. But they're locked. But they're locked, yeah. So this was a problem for us. I mean, what happened is when we went and ate at a restaurant, we'd say before we head back out, we better use the restroom because otherwise we're screwed. And so that is something that's absolutely important. Relieved visitors do spend more. It's really true. Yeah, good question. Okay, any other questions? Yes. I saw you focused on um, the pots and flowers. Yeah. Oh, we love trees. Street trees, by the way. Okay, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, Keep America Beautiful Network, a national nonprofit, did a study where they went into four downtowns, big and small. I think the smallest downtown was like 1,000 people. And they had no street trees. And they had them plant street trees every 30 feet in one block. Then what they did in these four towns all over the country, they watched the retail sales in that block compared to the rest of the town for a year. No other changes. And you know what happened? Each of those blocks, the retail sales in the block with the street trees was up nearly 20% more than all the blocks without street trees. That was the only difference with street trees. Street trees create a sense of intimacy, it creates traffic calming. And you know what I hear? You put the street trees, they're gonna block my signs. Or you put the street trees, public works. Street trees, they're going to pull up, the, they're going to root the sidewalks. Street trees, oh, the leaves are going to be on our storm trees. We put up all these excuses. You don't understand the power of trees. Street trees. One of the things we really liked about the loop was that one side of that, you have a lot of trees in there. It just created a sense of intimacy. Huge proponents. Street trees should be every 30 feet. Absolutely. And they can be lit up in the winter. In Greenville, South Carolina, they all complained about all the street trees they put in. They complained all those excuses plus more. You know what happened afterwards? Don't ever take those trees out because our retail sales went up sky high. It didn't matter about blocking our signs because people wanted to walk down our streets. Street trees are fantastic. And you could, they, nowadays they make great forms so the leaves don't. And you should always do street trees that create shade in the summer. You can light in the winter. Maples, those things, they add fall color, always. Beautification is powerful. However, you can't do beautification without making sure your business mix is right. And if you want to hear about business mix, come see me Friday morning in Racine. They have an incredible Main Street, but the business mix is weird. I mean, there's like one, there's no men's clothing in the entire downtown. There's one women's clothing store. There's 22 vacancies, but they could easily fix it. By the way, downtowns are back. You know, if you remember Petula Clark in 1964, <laughs> yeah. How many of you remember? You fell for it and just dated yourselves. <laughs> but you know what? She's 84 years old. She still looks great. She still sings that song. And you know what she says? My audience is in their 30s and they all know all the words because it's what they long for. No finer place for sure. Everything's great when you're downtown. I mean, you know, you don't want me to sing it because you'll be running for the exits. <laughs> so with that, thank you so much for spending the evening here. Thank you very much. <laughs>